Stefan. I'm the Youth and Access to Education Coordinator at FCJ Refugee Center. And today we are hosting a sex education webinar presented by Jasteep Singh and Jessica Mankan from uh, Inner City Health Associates, uh, supported by funding from Maitri through our Access to Education project. Uh, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to uh, the session and what we do at FCJ Refugee Center, and then I'll help hand it over to our presenters. Um, we'll go over a quick land acknowledgement of where our offices are physically located, a uh, uh, brief intro to FCG, FCJ Refugee Center and the primary care clinic uh, that has the connection with ICHA, uh, and then um, Jasteep and Jessica are going to go over UTIs, ST, BBIS, and sexual health resources. So the land acknowledgement for where our office is located is um, the land we're gathering on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many, first, many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. In uh, solidarity with First Nations people and understanding that us as newcomers and the folks that we support, be it refugees or folks with precarious migra uh, migration status, we understand that we are not the original inhabitants of this land, and whether we are um, indigenous to the lands we're coming from or we were guests on those lands as well. We understand and recognize that being in solidarity with the indigenous people of this nation is one of our key values as um, FCJ Refugee Center. So on commemorative days of the land called Canada, uh, like July 1st and September 30th, we don't celebrate, we reflect and we mourn with uh, and stand in solidarity with our fellow First Nations and Indigenous folks. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has um, declared 4,118 as the number of unmarked graves that have been um, found at the residential school sites. But we do recognize that that's not the true number and it is still counting. So the federal government did commit to looking and, and searching the other uh, residential school sites, but in the current federal budget, uh, it, it is absent that, that promise. So uh, something that we are doing is putting pressure on our local representatives, but also trying to do so on the federal level to make sure we're holding them accountable. Um, with that said, and keeping that in mind in the work that we do, FCJ Refugee Center um, is a nonprofit organization, uh, uh, and we've been s serving refugees and others at risk with their immigration status for the past, little over the past 30 years. Uh, our sort of vision and mission is shoulder to shoulder, side by side, walking with uprooted people. And you can see that in the work that we do, we welcome anyone uh, asking for advice, counsel or support regarding these issues. We ad address systemic issues that newly arrived refugee claimants and others with precarious migration status in Canada face, including lack of resources, marginalization and discrimination as well. Um, just as a reminder for anyone who's listening in and needs the support of interpretation, uh, on the bottom of the screen or at the top of the screen, you should see an option to select language and that will translate. We have the option of simultaneous translation in Spanish. Okay, uh, just to understand how the team at FCJ works. We are a very uh, diverse team. We work in a lot of different areas supporting newcomers and the teams themselves are very interdependent. So this is just a larger scale of the main teams in the office, but each of these teams have sub programs and subdivisions as well. So we have the anti-human trafficking team, access to education, refugee protection program, a youth, food security, networking, settlement programs, housing, advocacy, and popular education, um, in addition to the primary care clinic. So this webinar is sort of uh, uh, overlapping of access to education, pri the primary care clinic, and popular education as well. So the FCJ Refugee Primary Care Clinic uh, 
Kalka provides mental um, primary health care services, mental health care and self-care at our main location at 208 Oakwood Avenue um, in Toronto to meet the needs of precarious populations from diverse cultural backgrounds with unique health needs. The very essence of the program is to focus on the holistic health healthcare, which is an integrated approach to healthcare that treats individuals as a whole. The holistic model of care does not only provide primary health care, but also focuses on emotional, psychological, and spiritual well-being. FCJ Refugee Center identifies equity and culturally competent strategies as services um, and services as critical to improving and maintaining the health of vulnerable populations. The clinic focuses on illness prevention and health promotion. The primary care clinic of the FCG Refugee Center is funded by ICHA, Inner City Health Associates, providing primary care services and psychiatric services to uprooted people. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jasteep and Jessica to introduce um, Inner City Health Associates and carry us into the rest of this webinar. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, so just a quick um, background on Inner City Health Associates, ITCHA. Um, in 2005, a small group of physicians working with Toronto's homeless and precariously housed population came together and secured funding from Ontario Ministry of Health to form Inner City Health Associates, ITCHA. So ITCHA is Canada's largest homeless health organization and we work closely with shelter providers, community health and social support agencies, hospitals, the city of Toronto, uh, the regional health planners to bring integrated care and support to people who are homeless and precariously housed. It's just population health services uh, was launched in October, 2020 to add data-driven and community-level programming and dedicated public health capacity to ITRA's foundational clinical programs and services. So just like a little background of what we kind of do and where we started. Um, and I'll start off the presentation uh, by talking about UTIs. Um, next slide, please. So UTIs, which are known as urinary tract infections, so we did get a few questions. So what is a UTI? Um, a UTI is an infection in any part of the urinary tract system, which includes the kidneys, uterus, bladder, and urethra. UTIs are common infections that occur when bacteria from outside of the body enters the urethra and infect the urinary tract. UTIs infecting the kidneys are less common, but more serious than UTIs infecting the lower part of the urinary tract, such as the bladder. And who can get a UTI? So anyone is truly at risk of getting a UTI. However, some individuals are at high risk, such as females due to their anatomy. Uh, they have a shorter urethra, making it easier for bacteria to enter the urinary tract. Individuals who have urinary catheters, for example, those that are like in a hospital after surgery, they may, may need a urinary catheter and they will be at more risk of getting a UTI. Uh, individuals who have conditions that cause a weakened immune system, things like diabetes and so forth, they kind of have a harder time fighting, on, fighting off infections, which make them more likely to get UTIs. Individuals who have structural or obstruction of the urinary tract system, such as an enlarged prostate um, or kidney stones, which can kind of tend to trap urine and then lead to uh, bacteria and pregnancy as well. Next slide. How do you get um, in common ways of getting a UTI? So bacteria from outside the outside of the body can get into the urinary system, causing problems like inflammation and infection, which can lead to UTIs. So some common ways of getting UTIs, including bacteria entering the urethra into the urinary tract, things like bacteria from the rectum entering the, entering the urethra is a common way. Sexual activity and having a new sexual partner can also increase risk. Uh, changes in bacteria that reside in the vagina and vagina flora due to pregnancy and menopause, 
blockages in urinary tract from kidney stones or enlarged prostate, which can trap urine and bladder, leading to UTI, structural problems of the urinary tract. So for example, babies born with urinary tract um, structural problems, poor hygiene, urinary catheter use, urinary tract procedures such as surgery um, or exams that involve in, uh, medical instruments being introduced into the urinary tract leading to new um, bacteria. Next slide. So common symptoms of UTIs, so symptoms depend on the part of the urinary tract that is infected. So I did include a picture of both the female and male urinary tract system so you guys can get a better sense of what our urinary system looks like and all of the different parts. So if the urethra is infected, we can experience burning with urination and discharge. And if the bladder is infected, the common symptoms would include frequent and painful burning ur during urination, uh, feeling the need to urinate even with the empty bladder, lower belly discomfort, um, pelvic pressure, and blood and urine. And if the kidneys are involved, um, most likely the common symptoms would be back or side pain, high fever and chills, nausea and vomiting. Next slide. So at home treatment and over the counter treatment of mild UTIs. So it is very important to talk to a healthcare professional if you are experiencing symptoms of a UTI. And the reason is because typically they will prescribe antibiotics if you are positive for a UTI. Um, so it is important to take the antibiotics as instructed by your healthcare provider and complete the entire course of the medication. So again, any symptoms, make sure you are talking to a healthcare provider. Um, something that is new and good to know is pharmacists can now also prescribe medication for uncomplicated UTIs. So visit your local pharmacist if you are like having symptoms. Let's say if you don't have a family doctor or the wait is too long, you can always go to your pharmacist. A health card is needed for this service and it is a free service. And just some easy tips to follow. Um, so drink uh, plenty of water and fluids to allow bacteria to be flushed from the urinary tract. Wipe front to back after urinating or a bowel movement. Um, this will prevent the spread of bacteria from the anus, entering the vagina and urethra, and then getting a UTI. Avoid potentially irritating feminine products like new cleansers or other products that might be potentially irritating. Empty your bladder soon after having sex to eliminate any new uh, bacteria. And take showers instead of baths. Okay, so now I'm just gonna hand it over to uh, Jessica to discuss the next portion. So next we'll be talking about sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. So um, an STI is an infection that can be transmitted from one person to another uh, through sexual contact. So that could be exchange of semen, vaginal fluid, or other fluids, including oral sex. Bloodborne infections are transmitted by contact with contaminated blood. Some infections such as HIV, hepatitis B and C may be transmitted through both sexual and bloodborne transmission routes. So what is an STD? So an STD stands for sexually transmitted disease. Disease happens when the infection causes symptoms, damages parts of your body and leads to illness. The term STD is no longer used due to the negative connotation with the term. So the difference between STI and STD is that STD are infections that haven't yet developed into the disease and they may never develop into a disease. Um, so again, nowadays we typically use the term STI instead due to the stigma associated with the term disease where people assume it will permanently affect an individual. There are various types of STBBIs which are sexually transmitted or bloodborne infections. We divide them into three main categories, uh, bacterial, parasitic, and viral. And I'll go through each of the signs and symptoms on the next slides. So for bacterial, we have chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Chlamydia is, uh, well, chlamydia and gonorrhea are very similar as most are 
asymptomatic, so no symptoms are shown, but sometimes they do occur, which may include abnormal discharge from the penis or vagina and a burning sensation while peeing. Both are treated with antibiotics and diagnosed with a simple urine test. Syphilis um, is another infection. It can cause serious health problems if it's not treated. There's various stages of syphilis. So it starts off with sores around the penis, vagina, anus, rectum, and lips or in the mouth. These sores are usually firm, round, and painless. The sore goes away on its own, but the infection continues. In the next stage, there are skin rashes on the palms of your hands and bottoms of the feet, fever, sore throat, headaches, and weight loss. Um, and later on, if it's eventually not treated years down the road, um, it can affect different organs such as the heart and the brain, but it's easily treated with antibiotics and it's diagnosed with a blood test. In terms of parasitic infections, we have um, trick. So that's usually asymptomatic, but sometimes it can cause itching, irritation, redness, or soreness of the genitals discomfort or burning when peeing and discharge from the genitals. It's treated with antibiotics. Um, crabs, or also known as pubic lice, causes intense itching in the genital area. Um, they may see super small bugs or crab eggs, which are called nits. They're oval shape and yellow or white in color. It may be seen on the hair and then dark or bluish spots on the skin. Next slide. In terms of viral infections, um, there's HPV, um, which stands for human papillomavirus, which may be asymptomatic, but in some cases it can cause warts on the penis, vulva, or around the anus. There are many different strains of this virus, so some can cause health problems such as the genital warts or certain cancers. It's actually the most common STI, but there is a vaccine that can prevent some of the health effects that it causes. Um, next is herpes, which we also call HSV. It's often asymptomatic, but it can cause cold sores on or around the mouth or genitals. Um, there's no cure for herpes, but there are antiviral medications that can prevent or shorten the outbreaks. Next, we have hepatitis. It's often asymptomatic, but some people have symptoms years later, which may include fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark urine, light-colored stools, joint pain, and jaundice, which is yellowing up the skin. The last viral um, infection I'll be going over is HIV. So what is it? It's a virus that can weaken your immune system. People can have HIV for years without knowing it or showing symptoms, whereas others exp experience flu-like symptoms such as fatigue, fever, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, headache, loss of appetite, or a skin rash um, when they first get it. And then what is AIDS? So without HIV detection and treatment, a person's immune system can become too weak to fight off serious illnesses, and that person can eventually become sick with life-threatening infections and cancers. So when that stage happens, it is called AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Next slide. So how is it transmitted? So fluid containing the high levels of the HIV virus needs to get into the body of an HIV negative person. There are five body fluids that contain enough HIV to transmit the virus. So that includes blood, semen, rectal fluid, vaginal fluid, and breast milk. So that virus can enter the body through a mucous membrane, such as the opening of the penis, the foreskin, the vagina, or the rectum, or a break in the skin, such as sharing needles. So this can occur through unprotected sexual activity, sharing or reusing needles, and pregnancy and childbirth. Um, so there is a treatment for it nowadays. So there's HIV drugs, which work by preventing HIV virus from replicating in the body, but it has to be can taken consistently as it's prescribed. Uh, the drug reduces the amount of virus in the body, which we call the viral load, and the virus becomes undetectable. So thanks to this effective HIV treatment, most people nowadays with HIV will never get AIDS. So with proper treatment, people with HIV can live long and healthy lives and avoid passing HIV to others.
So how are sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections um, transmitted? So it can, a few different ways. So during vaginal anal sex um, without a condom, through oral sex, through oral anal contact, which is known as rimming, through sharing of sex toys, through skin-to-skin -skin contact of the genitals, and through sharing of needles. So how can these be prevented? So it's very important to use protection such as condoms when engaging in sexual activity, to clean sex toys after use, um, do not share, try not to share needles with others or reuse old needles. And it's really important to get tested for STIs regularly. So that's just a urine and a blood test. So on the next slide, um, we have some resources linked that have credible sexual health information that may be helpful for you if you're interested in learning more. And next slide. Um, so we have um, a page here that um, you can, your organization can book any vaccine clinic requests or any health promotion requests, and we can bring some of the services to you. Um, next slide. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. I hope we were able to answer some of the questions you had. Um, we have linked here some of our uh, co-workers. So if anyone has any additional questions, we can possibly answer a few now. Um, otherwise, you can email either Sarah or Stefan and he can forward it to us and we can get back to you guys with some answers. Thank you so much, Jasteep and uh, Jessica. This was a lovely webinar and it might be something that we could discuss into possibly creating into a series. Um, and I'm sure I'll connect with Sarah and, and uh, all of you all at the HR team and, and see how we can move forward with that. But like um, Jessica said, if any of you have any questions now, uh, you can put it in the chat. If it's the scope of what HR covers, they can answer it. If not, we'll see if we can uh, find some resources that we can share when we upload the PowerPoint alongside the webinar on the website. Let me maybe close the, you can take a picture of the contact information for Sarah, uh, who's the population health promoter at ICHA, and Elisa, uh, who runs the primary care clinic and also the vaccine engagement team at FCJ. And you can reach out to them to follow up on, on regards of any of this. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any particular questions that they'd uh, like to ask. If not, um, I believe we had scheduled for the session to run a full hour in case there were questions, but if not, we are good to uh, wrap up this short, brief introductory webinar. So I'll give a couple of minutes if anyone has any questions, either the chat or on mic. If not, um, thank you so much, uh, Jasteep and Jessica, for uh, taking your time to come and host the webinar, and also for everyone attending, and Jacqueline for doing um, simultaneous um, interpretation. Okay, I think we don't have any questions for today, so maybe we'll put out a survey again. We might come up with some list of common questions and we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you.